My name is Ron Neeran. I am the Director of International Programs for the Leadership Institute, which is presenting uh, this, uh, this session uh, today entitled Leadership DNA. A little bit of background about myself. Um, I was the Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor of California last year. And, and the good news is I got 3.1 million votes. The bad news is my opponent got 4 million votes, and that's why I can be with you here today <laughs> instead of in Sacramento, California. Um, I was the chairman of the California Republican Party from 2007 to 2011. I've been a conservative uh, grassroots activist uh, and leader for uh, 25 years. Uh, and uh, today I run the International Programs for Leadership Institute, which means that normally when I do these programs, I'm in Honduras, or I'm in Guatemala, or I'm in Mexico, or I'm you know, some other place multiple, multiple time zones away, Santiago, Chile, uh, Bogota, Colombia, etc. And uh, I got to tell you, I, get, I give about 55 different programs around the world, and this is my favorite one. Uh, we're going to run until about 4 o'clock. We might wrap up a little bit, uh, a little bit before then. Uh, and uh, and it, I don't think it's going to feel like you're sitting in a classroom. It's you know, this is designed to be a little bit, uh, a little bit fun. We have a bit, we have six videos which we're going to show as part of the presentation here today. And what we're going to talk about really is this. Um, Number one is that we have to recognize that if we want to put the ideas that bring us to a conference like this uh, into action, you know, what determines whether or not we're going to win? And I want to suggest to you that very often there are people who believe that being right in the sense of having the best ideas is enough to win. Right? That if we have the right position, the right pro-family position, God himself will reward us, we will prevail, our enemies will be vanquished, and that will be it. But we know that if we look at the world around us today, that that's not necessarily the case. And that very often the winner of a political contest, or the winner of any type of contest, is determined by something else. And I would suggest to you that the winner is the night. That the winner of a public policy contest is determined by the number and the effectiveness of the activists and the leaders on each side of the struggle. That is, if you look at American history as a series of movements, the women's suffrage movement, the temperance movement, the civil rights movement, the conservative movement in the 1980s, the evangelical movement in the 1980s, the Tea Party movement of you know, 2000, uh, 2009, 2010. The winner of a political contest over time is usually determined by the number and the effectiveness of the activists and the leaders on the side of the struggle. So the reason why we do a session like this here today is to help you in terms of maximizing your ability to organize and and so that's what we're really looking to provide you today. You will leave this room with more knowledge than you enter, and you will leave this room better prepared to lead and effectively argue on behalf of whatever movement uh, you're primarily concerned with. Uh, and, uh, and we know that World Congress of Families comes together because there are very critical battles that are taking place outside of this room uh, all the time, and we want to make sure that you're in the best position you know, going forward uh, to be prepared to leave. Uh, we're going to also going to talk a little bit about how people judge and choose, how people make choices and judgments. Uh, we're going to talk about what qualities people look for in a leader, so you don't have to guess. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the science of persuasion, how you can persuade other people to come in your direction, and then we probably won't have uh, enough time for that last part. So we're going to talk about leadership, but I'm not going to talk about leadership right away. Instead, first, I want to talk a little bit about how people think, judge, and choose. And I think what you're about to learn is going to be very helpful to you in every aspect of your life, not just uh, in the intersection of those issues that bring you here to World Congress of Family. So I'm going to ask you to tell me something about the following commercial, which has nothing to do with any of the issues before World Congress of Families, but I'm going to ask you some questions about this, so watch this. Hello, I'm a Mac. I'm a PC. Ready to get started? Oh, not quite. Got a lot to do. What's your big plan? I'd like to uh, make a little movie or maybe create a website, try my built-in camera. I can do it all right out of the box, so what about you? Well, well first got to download those new drivers, and I got to erase the trial software that came on my hard drive. Sweet. And I've got a lot of manuals to read. You know, it sounds like you have a lot of stuff to do before you do any stuff, so I'm just going to get started because I'm kind of excited. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> Actually, the rest of me's in some other boxes, so I'll meet up with you later. It's a great commercial, part of a very successful ad campaign from Apple. If 
I have to ask you, which of these two guys, if I would told you that one of them is a conservative, politically, is a conservative, and the other is not, how many of you would guess that it's the guy on the right who is the conservative? How many people of you would guess that it's probably the person on the left who is a conservative? Okay, I've asked this now in 14 countries, and every time people give the same response. That everyone says that the guy on the left is probably conservative. Can you tell me why? Because he moves. I'm sorry? He moves, he makes action. Okay. Shirt and tie, yeah. The guy on the left, why, who, why would you say the guy on the left is probably conservative? Yes. The way that he dresses. The way that he dresses. What about how he dresses? He's business casual, he has a red tie. He's, he's not business casual, he's in a suit, right? Yeah. He's not that there's anything casual. wrong with wearing a suit. No, not at all. <laughs> so what type of a suit is he wearing? What color? Brown. Kind of brown, right? Do you think that's on the cover of GQ these days? No. Yeah. Probably not. What, what else about how he's dressed? Not that there's anything wrong with that either. No. Okay. But what else? Someone over here? Yes. Uh, he's slow. He's backwards. He's behind the other opponent. He's behind his opponent, and he's generally unattractive. Okay. So you're talking. So you were talking about how he appears, and you're talking about a number of different things. Partly how he appears, but other otherwise how he's presenting himself, what he's saying. Right. What else? Yes. Well, for example, for me, I, I mean, I would be rather concentrated on the guy on the right yeah, in the sense too. because he looks like somebody that would be featured in a show called Portlandia. I don't know if you know it. It's it's basically about these hipsters in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So he looks like somebody who drinks his Starbucks, has an apple, and looks. He's like. Like I saw a person who looked like that the other day in a coffee place, and they had a sticker, uh, Utah for Bernie, and so he looks like somebody who would actually be of that kind. Right, so you're saying the person on the right well, is probably... Would be the trigger that the other guy is, is conservative, because he looks also... Because this guy looks like a big liberal. Yeah. Right? This latte drinking, Panera bread eating, <laughs> you know, it, he aspires to own a Prius, he rides his bike, even in the rain. Yes? I think for me, part of it is also the... I know that conservatives normally tend to be more raw, like they have to they have more money generally, or they at least dress like they do, so kind of even a suit. And I don't know, he just looks like he's, he's heading to work, like he's in a work environment and he has okay. a higher class job, okay. rather than a hipster sitting in a coffee shop, right? You know? You sure? I'm a writer, so. I'm sure. Not that there's anything wrong with being a writer. That's a <laughs> way, right? But, yeah. Okay, yes? He's old fashioned. He's old fashioned. What about him is old fashioned? Brown box. The brown box. Somebody mentions the box. So there's a difference, right, between it's the single largest object on the screen in terms of square inches, in terms of is the box, right? Brown box. Why do you think they put him in the brown box? Conservatives are viewed as old fashioned and the white looks fresh, it looks new. And conservatives tend to be like, that's back in the day, that's brown cardboard material. Okay. Rather than that's old school. Fresh. Old school boxes. Yeah. Yes. I was thinking the word traditional. Mm -hmm. You don't typically see a white box lying around, but you see a lot of cardboard boxes. Okay. Over here? Anything else? Oh, I, I, I don't mean to be controversial, but I, I viewed it, maybe because I'm an artist, I don't really know, but like I viewed that the one on the right, for me personally, would be more conservative than the one on the left. Okay. Just so one of these guys voted for George W. Bush, and the other didn't. Who's the guy who voted for George W. Bush instead of Robert Obama? Or, or voted for Mitt Romney instead of Robert Obama? I still pick one on the right. Okay. It's just because I, I do you want me to explain? Sure. Um, I had a lot to do with the movement. Maybe I'm looking at it in a different way, but I find that the one on the right is a lot less vivacious and um, loud than the one on the left. The left, I feel like he wants his opinions to be heard, and he he's always like standing <coughs> strong, and they're more like more movement, more expression, rather than I, I, the demeanor of a conservative, I, I would find less expressive. Okay. Now I have another question for you. Did it take you longer to draw the, to draw the conclusion as to which one was probably the conservative, or did it take you longer to come up with the reasons why? Reasons why. Reasons why. Took you longer to come up with the reasons why, right? You have now discovered the difference between intuition and reasoning. 
And this is something which I hope that you really grasp and use for the rest of your life. Because this is really important in understanding how to persuade people and how people make judgments first. So let me start with intuition. Intuition is how most of the decisions and most of the judgments you make throughout the day are made. Intuition is recognizing something, judging and choosing and doing so automatically without even thinking about it. That's what your intuition is. So if you walk out of this room and you walk down into the lobby and there's two people having a fist fight in the lobby, <coughs> intuitively you know we're probably going to go out the side door. Right? You don't really have to put a lot of thought into that. Right? You see that, you recognize what it is, potential danger, I'm going to go in the other direction. And you did so automatically, right, without consciously making a decision to do something about it. Most of the judgments that most people make during the course of the day are done intuitively. Reasoning is something different. Reasoning is what we do really only in two cases, when we are either explaining or persuading. That's when we're using our reasoning. So when you were just explaining why you think the case is it's the, other, the other way, which by the way is no right or wrong answer. The reason why I ask you those questions is to show you the difference between intuition and reasoning. So if you're trying to explain to me why the person is the conservative or not, you're using the reasoning part of your brain. And to put it a different way, put it visually, the intuition is, is the elephant. Your intuition is the elephant. It's big, it's dominant, it's going to go where it wants to go. Because it's going to see something, it's going to respond to it, and it's going to go where it wants to go. Your reasoning is kind of like the rider. More sophisticated, higher brain function, more complicated thought. And at the end of the day, your reasoning serves your intuition, which most people don't think autom automatically is the case. Most people intuitively think, I don't know, the reasoning part of my brain is in charge. The reasoning part of who I am is in charge. My, no, it's the, it's the opposite. Your reasoning serves your intuition. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of that in just a second. <coughs> intuition is an automatic response to things we recognize. We're judging and choosing based upon what we know or based upon what we believe to be true. So last night there was a Republican presidential debate in Denver. Uh, my colleague Robert and I were in the audience uh, in Denver, and uh, there was a point where one of the candidates ripped the media for being biased and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, and the audience erupted uh, in applause. Because that speaker had said something which the audience believed to be true. So your intuition is based on what we know or what we believe to be true. So here's an example about how this works. So let's say you're going to be home from this conference, the World Congress, very, very, very late. You're going to be home like hours and hours late, that later than you were expecting to be home. And this is going to be you when you get home. <laughs> this is going to be whoever is expecting you to be home. And intuitively, you know that this is not going to be pleasant. Right? You don't have to do a lot of thinking to figure out that when you show up at home, you know, eight hours late, uh, that, uh, that this is going to be an unpleasant experience. And so what do you do? You call upon the reasoning part of your brain to get you out of it. And when you're coming up with the reasons why you're late, I was at this wonderful conference uh, at, in Salt Lake City. It was really, really informative. It was wonderful. I met all these great people and all these, these great discussions. The best one was by this guy, this really good looking guy from the Leadership Institute who had all these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful things to say. And, uh, you know, I learned all these things are going to, you know, help me forever. Da, 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 da. When you're doing that, that's the reasoning part of your brain being able to work. And so your intuition, your reasoning is serving your intuition. <clears throat> and in life, the advantage goes to the leader or the communicator who has intuition on their side, meaning it's to your advantage that you have people's intuition going the way you want it to go, rather than going in the other direction. Because your ability to persuade people is very, very limited. Think about all the things that are involved in trying to persuade someone. Number one, they have to be open to hearing you. Number two, they have to actively listen to you. 
Number three, they have to think you're credible. Number four, they have to think it's worth the time necessary to listen to your spiel uh, in order to sit there. There's a lot of things that could go wrong when you're trying to persuade people. But if people are coming your way intuitively, that's, that's a very, very different thing. That really works to your advantage. So what type of signals are you sending to people, or am I sending to people, that inform their intuition? For example, visual signals. So we, you mentioned earlier the guy, the guy's suit, right? He wasn't in a pinstriped, very cool, uh, you know, he wasn't wearing an Armani suit in that ad, right? He was kind of frumpy, right? What else did we see about him? He was fat, he had a boring hair color, uh, a boring haircut. He was wearing a watch, the other guy wasn't wearing a watch. Um, uh, we saw he was in the brown box. All of these things are visual signals, but you have kind of touched on some of the behavioral signals, some of the things that he was saying. So these are signals as well. Other signals are like your affiliations. Who are you affiliated with? Who is someone else affiliated with? These are signals as well. Who are your allies? Who are your adversaries? These also inform or influence people's intuitive judgments. So here's how, an, when you are communicating with people, here's how an audience makes a judgment. So I use this little symbol to represent a signal, right? They see something, they observe something, and based upon their own values, their own life experiences, what type of day they're having, etc., their intuition could send them in multiple different directions. Probably only one, right? But it could, the range, there's a range out there. Someone can see something about you and they don't like it. They automatically don't like you. On the other hand, they might see something that they do like. And ideally, someone is intuitively reaching the conclusion you want them to, to reach. They see some point, that person really was really friendly, really informative, I really like them, you know, etc. Or, you know, they rejected you. And this is a lot harder to get someone to accept this if at first they intuitively reject you. Right, so think about it this way. This is the short path. This is the easy path right, to getting someone to come your way. The expensive, difficult way that might fail is this way. Someone intuitively, intuitively sees something about you, they decide they don't like it, and then you have to try to persuade them and pull them back. So, for example, I, when I was a Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor of California last year, and I would go campaign in San Francisco, right, whose politics is very left-wing, slightly to the left of Pyongyang, North Korea. Uh, and if I showed up and said, hi, I'm Ron Nearing, I'm the conservative, pro-life, pro-traditional family, Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor. Right. If, that, if those are the signals I'm starting with, with a typical San Francisco audience, which way have they gone? Right, they are all, they're like all the way here. Right, they're like here, right? Am I going to get them back? Probably not. Right. So think about all of the bandwidth that I have to use to try to pull it, and I'm never going to get them there anyway. So is that the signal that I want to send? No. So when I would show up in San Francisco, and I would know my audience and who I'm communicating with, I don't change my beliefs. I'm never going to hide from my beliefs. I'm pro-life, pro-traditional marriage, anti-tax, I'm, you know, pro-Second Amendment, you name it, I'm not going to change who I am. But I'm not going to start with those things which are going to send my audience way out here. Instead, I'm going to start by telling them my story. And I might start by letting people know that my story didn't start in California. My parents weren't even born in America. My parents were born in Nazi Germany. My mother was born in 1941. My father was born in 1934. Uh, they lived during the time of Nazi Germany. And all the depression and misery and war and occupation and everything that followed. And then when my father was, uh, was 18 years old, he found a way to get out of that town, this poor fishing and farming village he grew up in. He only had a 10th grade education. He became a sailor in the German Merchant Marines, and he sailed around the world for seven years, mainly bringing Volkswagens to South America and bananas back to Germany and things like that. And then when he was done, he met my mother. He was 26. She was, uh, she was 19. He did two things. Number one, incredibly, he convinced her to marry him, it's <laughs> astonishing, uh, but way to go, Dad. And uh, number two, he convinced her that they should leave Germany behind, the land where they knew the language, the land where all their family was, and they should go to America, where they had no family, didn't speak the language, and had no money. 
And that's what they did. That's how they came to America. And when I would start by telling that story, you could see the tension level come down in the audience. Because now, all of a sudden, I'm not some politician. I'm a person. And now, I've not sent any signals that, that, that set them off in this direction. In fact, in a very large immigrant state, I've told an immigrant story, which intuitively brings people in my direction. Now, when they hear that I'm a conservative Republican and pro-life, pro-traditional marriage in San Francisco, with some of them, it's, you know, it's going to send them off in a different direction, but not all of them. So I'm going to be ahead of the game. I'm going to be ahead of where I otherwise was if I would just start with those things that intuitively are sending them in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So easy, hard. Right? So that's really the first point here, keeping in mind the impact of intuition versus reasoning. And I'm going, to, I'm going to circle back to that in a second. So intuitively, what are some of the things that people look for in a leader? And by the way, you may not think of yourself as a leader today. You may not think of yourself as someone who aspires to be a leader. But if you ever speak before any number of people, three people or less, you're a communicator, and it's no different than being a leader. So everything that I'm about to say applies to communicators as much as it does leaders. Because regardless of whether you think yourself as a leader, you are. If three people are paying attention to what you're saying, you are a leader. And they're going to look for certain qualities in you as you have that conversation with them. So what do people look for? Well, first of all, draw your attention to what's at the very bottom of this list. Things like me. You might think, oh, well, people are only going to look for other people who think the way they do. That's actually not true. Many Americans recognize that people in so-called leadership positions might be different than they are. So there are other qualities that they consider to be much more important. Look what's at the top of that list. It's honesty. It's not holds the same positions on issues that I have. In fact, that's nowhere on this list. What people look for in a leader, there's a different set of qualities. Number one is honesty. Number two, someone who gets things done, has high ethical standards, demands high ethics of those people uh, around them, has a clear vision. Look at this. Cares about people like me, 69%. Thinks like me, 45%. This quality of caring is going to come up a lot over the course of the next couple of minutes. Cares about people like me, strong, makes me feel more secure, give me, gives me peace of mind. By the way, these are closely related. Has new ideas, stands for personal independence. But look at these things up at the top. Honesty, strength, and care. These are qualities that people expect in a leader. We're in the process of electing a new president of the United States, a process which, in my opinion, cannot get over soon enough. And what are pe people right now are evaluating potential leaders against certain things which they consider to be important. So we start with leaders are people who provide vision. And so regardless of what you're trying to accomplish, maybe you run a group on campus, maybe you're involved with a group in your community, or you're trying to impact legislation, or whatever it is, what is your vision for either your city, or your town, or community, or your group, or your church, or whatever it is, what is your vision? Because Americans hire drivers, not mechanics. Americans hire drivers, not mechanics. We hire people to get us somewhere, right? Which is why you're not going to see anybody running for president of the United States today who's going to say, I really know the inner workings on the fifth floor of the Department of Health and Human Services building on 12th Street in Washington. No one's going to say that, because that's not what people are looking for. When people understand that we hire them. There are other people who are going to do the mechanics. But in a leadership position, we're looking for someone who's going to provide vision. So what are the goals? Where do we want to go? Where do we want to take our group, our church, our community, whatever that happens to be? But having a vision is not enough. If having a vision is enough, then you could be in the clergy, or you could be uh, in the philosophy department at the local university. Because very often, those are people who deal with how the world should be. But leaders do something else. Leaders have an additional burden beyond just having a vision. And that is to turn that vision into reality. Because the true test of a, vision, of a leader 
is the ability to induce positive change in people's lives. Not to talk about how the world should be, but to actually make a difference. So in the presidential debate last night, every candidate says, I'm the only one who's done this. I'm the only one who's done that. What they're trying to do is distinguish themselves, but they're distinguishing themselves not based on what their vision is. No one says, I'm the only one who wants America to get be better. It's not about vision. It's about this. It's about whether they've actually gotten things done, whether they've made a promise and then kept it. The reason why I include that photograph, that's a picture of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, Dubai, 40 years ago, was a little fishing and farming village on the Arabian Gulf. And that's it. And today, it has the world's tallest building, this one. That's the world's busiest airport. It has the, world, the world's most expensive hotel. Uh, it is a tourist destination for all of Europe. And they have no taxes. It's pretty, pretty impressive, right? Because the leadership said, we want to have the world's biggest building. So it wasn't just talking about it, but it's turning it into reality. So you should think about, when you tell your story, I'm going to get a little bit into telling your narrative, what have you accomplished in your life? It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be, you know, I discovered the theory of relativity. Maybe it, was, maybe it was something you did with a family member, or for a family member, or for... Whatever you've accomplished, something that you've accomplished is an important part of your narrative or your story. If you're looking for work at some point, a critical part of your CV that very often, by the way, is absent from most CVs that I see, don't list any accomplishments. It's, I held this position, I held this position, I held this position. Tell me what you accomplished. Some big project you ran, some big event you did, something that you accomplished that you were able to turn vision into reality. What type of challenges have you faced? What does this story tell us about you? And how did other people benefit from what you accomplished? These are things that very often we overlook. But if, if we accomplish nothing else today, I hope I raise your awareness about certain things. Then you bear that in mind going forward. Trait number three is that leaders are strong. Franklin Delano Roosevelt led the United States through the greatest loss of life and, and military conflict in American history, World War II. In fact, um, when I arrived at Salt Lake City Airport this morning, uh, there was an honor flight of World War II veterans uh, getting ready to board a flight to Washington, D.C. These honor flights are flights um, arranged so that World War II veterans can see the World War II memorial in Washington, D.C. before they pass away. And I got to tell you, it's hard for me to keep, uh, you know, um, uh, from shedding. You know, my eyes kind of missed up a little bit when I see these incredible heroes, you know, lining up. And these are people who have strength. But FDR, who was president of the United States at the time, was crippled. He could not walk. He was in a wheelchair his entire adult life. You will, you will very rarely, if ever, find a picture of FDR in a wheelchair. Why? Because at the time they were very concerned that it would undermine this, that it would be perceived as weak. So whether someone's in a wheelchair or not, to me, does not mean whether indicate whether they're weak or strong. Uh, in fact, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, uh, is a spine of steel, but he's in a wheelchair due to an accident. It doesn't make him weak. But at the time, in the 1930s and 40s, it was perceived that if you were a cripple, uh, that you were weak. And so this quality people look for in a leader is that of strength. And strength doesn't come from, you know, whether you're in a wheelchair or, or you know, whether you walk with a cane or not. Uh, the men and women who I saw in the Salt Lake City Airport this morning were men and women of strength. Half of them were in wheelchairs. That doesn't mean they lack strength. But this is an important, strength is defined by your actions and your response to adversity. And you're going to face adversity in your life. No doubt you face adversity thus far, and you will face more of it going forward. But Americans want leaders in positions of responsibility who have the strength necessary to face adversity. That's why we look for it. Number four is that leaders care. And if there is any vulnerability 
of people who are self-described conservatives like me, it is in this area. Because inherently, many people believe that if you are on the left, that you are more caring than if you are on the right. People on the right, very often, and this includes social conservatives, people who are pro-life, people who are pro-judicial marriage, and so on, are perceived too often as being rigid, ideological, and uncaring. That's not a statement of how the world should be. It's a statement about how the world is. And that's why it's important that those of us who share conservative, pro-family values make clear that we possess this quality. This is vitally important. I cannot tell you how many losses have been suffered in the struggle for traditional values because the advocates are seen as uncaring. You don't care about homosexuals, you don't care about women, you don't care about the young, you don't care about the poor, you don't care about the disadvantaged, you don't care about anyone except for your rigid ideology. That is very often what our opponents will say. And if you don't have anything in your narrative to push back against that, guess what's going to prevail? That narrative is going to prevail. So that's why it's important that we highlight these aspects. This does not mean that this is an accurate portrayal, but it's not our, the role of our adversaries to portray us accurately. If the only way you're going to win a fight is if your opponent fairly represents who you are, you're going to lose every time. It's not your opponent's job to tell your story. It's your job to tell your story. I'll talk a little bit more about this quality in a few minutes. And number five, leaders are honest. So I see a lot of people, I see most people in the room are younger than I am. So I want to give you a piece of advice. And I hope that you will listen to this, and I hope that you will remember this forever. And that is, in the course of your life, somebody is going to come to you at some point, one or more times, and they're going to offer something, that you do something that you know is unethical. You're going to know it intuitively. That this is not something that should be done. And I want to encourage, and sometimes, it's not going to be easy to say no. If it were easy, you wouldn't think about it. If it's hard, because there's some inducement involved, then you might think about it. And I just want to encourage you right now to think about this. Anytime someone who is unethical is in trying to induce you to do something that is also unethical, if you agree to that, here's the point. If you agree to that, that person has leverage over you forever. You are forever subject to extortion or blackmail by that person. Because that person knows that you did something you shouldn't have done. And at times it might be difficult to say, no, well, I might lose this or I might lose this opportunity. Or there's, some, there's some inducement I might lose out on. I just want to encourage you to say no to that. And if there comes a time when you're faced with that difficult challenge, I want you to think about our getting together right here at World Congress of Families now in Salt Lake City. And what I said, and I hope that you will just say no to that. And you might suffer a momentary loss. But you know what? You're, let me tell you what your career is not going to look like. It's not going to look like this. It's not going to look like that. It's going to look like this. Right? And you know what? This is better than this. And this is what you represent. Denny Haster, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, pleaded guilty this week to a financial arrangement, which basically he had been paying off somebody to the tune of $3.4 million uh, for years. Denny Haster did something he should not have done. And someone else used that as leverage on him for his entire life. And I cannot tell you how much better you will feel if that you are never in that position. And so this may sound elementary. This may sound like, oh, God, we've heard this all before. I want to tell you, as someone who's 45 years old and has, has been in a position of raising millions of dollars, we raised $74 million when I was chairman of the California Republican Party. All types of people show up with all types of crazy ideas. And the answer always has to be no. It has to be no. Even if you suffer for the moment, in the long term, you're going to be much better off. And you'll deny bad people the opportunity to have leverage over you. So, end of lecture on that particular topic, but I just want you to bear that in mind. Thank you. And number six, leaders are fair. This is another area where those of us who believe in traditional values very often get painted as unfair. Well, your pro-life position is not fair to this uh, impoverished uh, woman or family who's not going to be able to afford to raise that child. That's unfair. 
your position is unfair. And our position on the left is looking out for that disadvantaged person. Whether that story is believed or not is going to be up to you. Whether you recognize that you must be the person who is seen as treating others fairly, fairly, particularly if they're perceived to be disadvantaged. And I'm going to show you that in a very powerful way in just a couple minutes. Leaders can recognize when others are being exploited, particularly the vulnerable. You need to be the champion of people who are subject to being taken advantage of. You need to be the champion of those people who are otherwise suffering. Not to be portrayed as someone who's some rigid ideologue who's trying to hurt other people in the name of some abstract and rigid ideology, which is very often how our team gets portrayed. So, six leadership imperatives. One, leaders provide vision. Number two, leaders get things done. They turn the vision into reality. Number three, leaders are strong. They have the strength to overcome adversity. Number four, leaders care. They're honest and they're fair. These are the qualities that people look for most in a leader. But it's not only those qualities, because you personally must appear credible when you're communicating with somebody else. So I live in San Diego, which means it would be perfectly appropriate by San Diego standards if I showed up for this lecture in cut-off shorts, flip-flops, and a t-shirt. Maybe a shirt with a collar. Right? That would be typical of like San Diego. But however, would you pay as much attention to what I have to say if I showed up that way? You wouldn't. Right? Because intuitively you'd say, you know, this guy's on drugs. <laughs> right? Or some, you know, something's wrong with this guy. Beach pop. <coughs> exactly. So your personal credibility is vitally important because it influences people's intuitive judgments. So what does that mean? Well, here are the, some things that influence a person's credibility. So Robert hires people, I hire people. This is, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for the qualities in a leader that I just described. But we also want to make sure that we're only hiring someone who's credible, or we are only working with people who are credible. That includes what type of relationships do you have? When you have someone speaking on your behalf or vouching for you, what you're doing is you're borrowing upon their credibility. You may not be well known, but someone else is well known. That's what a letter of recommendation is. If you're job hunting, a letter of recommendation is you are borrowing upon the credibility of the person making the recommendation. What's your narrative or your story? I'm going to talk about that as well. I don't just want to know what you believe. I want to know your story about how you got here wherever here is. What's your person? Don't tell me the story of your organization or your, you know, or your school or your employer or whatever. What's your story? How does that, how does that bring, what does that say about you? Your affiliations, your successes. By the way, everyone's going to get a copy of the PowerPoint. I don't think I said that before. That's helpful, right? Okay. Now, don't stop taking notes. If you stop taking notes, you're not going to retain as much. Why do we take notes? Because then we're going to remember a whole lot more of it. We don't do it because someone's saying you must take notes, but you'll, you'll retain more of it. So, but if you filled out the form and you included your email and it was legible, then we get an email and we can get the presentation. Um, I think my personal score just went up by sharing that with you. Um, what's the credibility of your institution? If you're out raising money for your school, what type of credibility does that school have? What is the credibility of the institution? And then finally, what's the quality of your presentation? You know, I hate to tell you, but we've all been lied to, usually by our mothers. Because at some point, every mother says to their child, honey, don't judge a book by its cover. It's what's inside that really counts. Well, we've all been told this. Don't judge a book by its cover. But if you find the last remaining bookstore in Salt Lake City, I don't know where it is, the, the one that's not been put out of business by Amazon, if you go in there and you look around, you're going to find millions of dollars of what? Book covers. Right. Because people do judge books by their cover because people make judgments based upon cues and signals. Remember this. Quality in presentation implies quality in content. I'll say that again. Quality in presentation implies quality in content. If you are presenting it well, the implication is the content 
is of good quality as well. So bear that in mind. So we have your personal credibility that's important. You can have all the traits of leadership that I said earlier, but if you do not present yourself as a personally credible individual, then it doesn't really matter. Because people will have intuitively reached that point of rejecting you before you even have a chance to demonstrate those qualities. There's also the credibility of the institution. How many of you are involved with your church, um, a, a family group, you're, or, you're affiliated with some type of institution? Yes? Okay. Everybody. Okay. Good. So the, ins the credibility of your institution is vital as well. Because when you say, hi, I'm here on behalf of whatever that institution is, if I show up and I say, um, I'm here on behalf of congressman such and such, well, I now carry the credit, I'm now influenced perception of me is influenced by the credibility of that institution. So what influences institutional credibility? Well, it's history. This is the World Congress of Families 9, right? 9. So what is the history of the World Congress of Families? That has an impact as to how people perceive the institution. What has the institution accomplished? Who are its supporters? What is the quality of the institution's credibility? Uh, but this is why it's so important that I, I cannot emphasize this enough with people who are under 30 is to please pay attention to what you post on your Facebook page or your Twitter feed or your Instagram or whatever. And remember that the E in email stands for evidence. Um, employers routinely will look at your Facebook page, your Twitter, you know, etc. And if you don't have one, then people want to know why you don't. Did you just shut it down? before you apply for the job, because you have something to hide, it raises all types of questions. So be careful about, in this era of social media, where privacy has kind of gone out the window, our conduct becomes very much something by which people can evaluate. So what type of presentation does the institution make? Is the institution compatible with who we're trying to talk to? Who represents the institution? You know, whenever Robert and I go on the road and we're talking to people about doing training and what we can do to help them, uh, we don't show up in flip-flops. I, I, I believe it or not, I don't own a pair of flip-flops. I know this is a total surprise and shock to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, we don't show up casual, you know, because we're very disciplined. We are representing an institution, and if no one, we have a wonderful building. We have a building in Arlington, Virginia, Leadership Institute does, five stories tall, television studios, classrooms. It's very impressive. But I can't bring the building with me. Okay. Right? People are going to judge me based upon what I look like and what I give to them and the quality of my presentation. So <clears throat> here's part three. Um, um, by the way, you can ask questions along the way. Okay. So yeah, immediately the hand goes up. I love <laughs> all this pent up questions. Uh, yes, go ahead. So you talk a lot about personal and institutional <clears throat> credibility, yeah. which I think is really important talk a little bit about developing personal credibility um, with yourself. You know, does that credibility mean being disciplined in what we read? I, I mean, just what is that? When you talk about developing personal credibility, can you drill down on Yeah, I'll drill, I'll, yeah so let me go back to, to this slide here uh, in terms of the credibility of the individual. Right. So, so you know, like, I don't want to be walking around saying, I did this, I did that, I right. did that. So, Find incredible. Right. There's a way to develop that or within yourself. Yeah. If you're self-motivated, but what is that? Yeah. So this is as much art as it is science. Right. Uh, so, so number one, there are many aspects of this. It is a combination of things: your appearance, your conduct, and the context. Your appearance, your conduct, and the context. So. For example, if I am um, running into someone at an event, I'm going to write my cell phone number uh, on a piece of paper. Right? So I'm going to pull my pen out, and I'm going to write the number down. The minute I start writing, where does the other person's eye go? It's going to go right here. What happens if I pull out my three-year-old Bic pen with the end chewed off as I'm writing the number out? 
No. It doesn't affect anything we've talked about. But I'm walking around with a three-year-old disgusting, this, which this is not, uh, <laughs> a three-year-old disgusting pen, you know, I look like a nut, right? And people have limited amounts of time, and people don't want to waste their time with someone who they don't perceive to be credible. So how we look, what we do in terms of our behavior, uh, and I don't have enough, there's not enough time in the week to go over all of the different things that we see. But we want to be sensitive to certain things. For example, I'll run into people at conferences and who have no concept of respecting another person's time. They can see that I'm going from point A to point B, I'm dragging my bags, it looks like I'm good, and they will stop me and want to discuss in fine detail the exact elements of their proposals for privatizing the sidewalks in the city of San Diego. Right? And that is simply being behaviorally insensitive to who you're communicating with. So your conduct has as much of an influence as your appearance. Uh, and instead, the better approach for someone is to say, hey, I know you're busy, so number one, I respect your time. Uh, I have an issue I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, I know you're running somewhere. Can I leave you with this, and can, you, can we perhaps follow up? Great, that's not taking five seconds. It doesn't put me in an awkward position. And these are just matters of social graces. So I recommend a couple of books. One is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Right. So I have, by, by mentioning that book, I've now shortened the presentation from eight hours to two. Right. So number one, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, there's going to be um, another book called Never Eat Alone, which is about building relationships as the foundation to being successful in life. Uh, and then the third book, which I'm going to recommend, but I have to finish the presentation before the recommendation makes any sense. So. Those are a couple of things that, you know, that I would drill down on. So our conduct and then the context. And that's where your reputation comes in. And so you know, we have to be very careful about guarding our, our reputation. You know, unfortunately, people who are involved in public life have less protections about that in the United States. Because the, the standard, the burden of proof for libel and slander cases is much higher when you're a public official. You can pretty much say anything about a public official unless you can prove Someone knew it was wrong and proved malice. You know, you, you know, so people say all types of crazy things. So that context is relevant as well. So there's no such thing as, well, I don't have to look decent today because I don't have any meetings. You, know, you never know who you're going to run into. You know, I was in line at Costco. Life is full of things that you don't expect happen. You know, you run into people, you develop a reputation. A reputation is something that you develop when you're not paying attention. <coughs> reputation is what you develop when you're not paying attention. So we want to pay attention all the time. So let me go through a little bit more of this, and if you if you want me to follow up more, I'll I'll do that. Um, were there any other questions at this point? Oh, as we go, yes. You, um, you had a quote, quality in presentation equals... Quality in content. Okay. Thank you. I just didn't get that last. Okay. Well, if you look sharp, people expect what you're saying is accurate. Okay. If you look like a slouch, people think you're a nut. And everything you're saying is probably wrong. Can you reiterate that? Can you reiterate that sentence? Quality in presentation implies quality in content. Thank you. Quality in presentation implies quality in content. You're welcome. So now part three. Um, this is the, like the really cool part. We're going to watch a couple videos. It's going to be cool. Um, I want to introduce you to six moral foundations that drive people's reactions, their judgments, and their choices. This is based on research conducted by a uh, moral psychologist at the University of Virginia named Jonathan Haidt. It was a wonderful book. I'll give you the title of the book after I show you how interesting this is. So you send signals. How do people respond to them? And I'm going to ask you to keep a little, I, a little question in the back of your mind. What makes a movie a good movie? Don't answer. Just think about it. What makes a movie a really good movie? I'm going to let you Google on that for a minute as I walk you through this. 
going to show you six, the six moral foundations that drive people's judgments and their choices. Number one, this is the most important list of the day. Um, and this is going to change how you perceive the world and how you, how you communicate. We develop certain sensitivities as human beings, as people. We develop these for a variety of different reasons. <clears throat> the first on this list is we have a sensitivity to need or suffer. Right? So when I was in Guatemala, when I, was, I was at Hope of Life International, which runs a hospital, an orphanage, a food bank, etc., for poor people in Guatemala, of which there are many. These charities exist. Why? Because we're sensitive to signs of need or suffering as human beings. If I walk outside and I see a child face down on the sidewalk crying, I'm going to have an emotional response to that. Right? I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to be compelled to act. I'm going to be compelled to do something. Why? Because this moral foundation of caring has been triggered. When this is triggered, I have an emotional response. Emotion drives behavior. Emotion drives behavior. So we're sensitive to signs of need or suffering because if we weren't, we would have died off a long time ago. If we were not sensitive to children, if we were not sensitive to, to the vulnerable, we would have died off. None of us would be here. We, you know, none of us, none of us would make it past, you know, a week old if we didn't have someone who cared about us at that moment of infancy. And we despise people who are cruel toward us or to others. We despise people who are cruel to us or to others. Now, I saw the video footage of that Jordanian pilot who was shot down over Syria. Uh, crash, who parachuted out of his plane and was captured by ISIS, he was put in a cage, he was burned alive. Right? We have an, an emotional response to seeing that. The King of Jordan had an emotional response, a very, very strong emotional response, and he took a lot of action as a result. But we have an emotional response to that because this was seen as cruel and creating suffering, and we hate the people because of this. The second is fairness, or the opposite of that is cheating. We develop this sensitivity for a completely different reason, and that is we're sensitive to signs of exploitation. And this goes to how we form relationships. We form relationships with something called reciprocal altruism. What that means is I do something for you, and I don't ask anything in return. And you do something for me, and you don't ask for anything in return. And that becomes the basis of developing relationships. If we kind of are always asking for something in return, we come across as transactional and people don't like that. But if we form these relationships, but we're always the one giving and we're never the one receiving, it makes us feel a little weird, right? And you feel a little bit of a, I'll give an example. So I have a house in San Diego, I'm never there. And I ask my neighbor across the street, can you keep an eye on my house? And she says yes. Can you bring my mail in? She says yes. Can you keep an eye on it? Could you ask your husband to mow my lawn? She says yes. Now, if I keep doing this for long enough, she's going to get, she's going to feel a little bit weird, right? What, what's that weird feeling? It's triggered because of this, right? So how do I solve this problem? Well, I found a solution to the problem. My neighbor loves to swim. She doesn't have a swimming pool. Guess who's got a swimming pool? Mm -hmm. Guess where my neighbor is going to be tomorrow? <laughs> At my swimming pool in my backyard. Problem solved. Right, so I'm doing something for her. She can come over, use the pool, use the barbecue, whatever you want. We just keep it on my house. Boop, no more problem. The emotional feeling of exploitation goes away because I'm no longer triggering this moral foundation. You see how that makes how that works? Something becomes emotional when one of these six things is being triggered. Okay. The third one is liberty. Liberty is a sensitivity that there's a bully in the group. That somebody is pushing other people around. 
This is why we have a country called America. Because King George was seen as the bully who was pushing Americans around in an unfair way, and he was a despot. And what happened? We rose up and we threw him out. We threw the British out. So whenever you see people uniting to throw out a bully, it's because of this moral foundation that's being triggered. For very often for people on the right, liberty means freedom from big, annoying government. For many people on the left, liberty means freedom from Bank of America or for some big corporation. It's the same moral foundation. The only difference is in who the oppressor is seen as being. The third is authority. We're sensitive to signs of rank or status. So if we walk outside and we park our car on the street, and there's a police officer standing next to the next to the parking meter, we're probably going to get. We would probably. And he says the parking meter is broken, but he can give me the money. He's wearing a uniform. He looks credible. Probably give him the money. We're sensitive to signs of rank or status. Why do pilots and first officers on airplanes wear uniforms? Why does anyone wear a uniform? It has to do with rank or status. Why do we have uniforms in the military? Why do we have ribbons? It's signs of rank or status. Now, why do we develop this sensitivity? Because we could not exist in, complex, in a complex society without social hierarchies. We'd have chaos. Right? So, you come to a program, you know I'm the speaker. No one so far has come up and said, I'm going to take over, I'm going to give the talk. Right? Because we're respecting each other, and so we're sensitive to signs you know, of our respective roles. And that's because of this authority moral foundation. The most complicated one is that of sanctity. Sanctity is it's, it's very, very complicated. And th there are easy examples, but the only cover a little bit of how complicated this is. Um, why do we respond differently to a church burning down, to a regular building burning down? Why do we respond differently to an arsonist burning a church down, to an arsonist burning down a post office? We respond to that differently because we assign greater value to the church building, even though it's, it's a building. It's made of wood concrete and metal and so on. It's made of the same stuff as a post office. But we respond very differently when the church burns down than the post office burns down. We respond very differently to someone burning an American flag or the flag of our country to someone burning a blanket. It's just cloth. What's the difference? It's this moral foundation. That's different. Yeah. So I've been in Jerusalem uh, ten times, and I've walked the Via Dolorosa, which is the route uh, Christ walked from the to the crucifixion, and to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the last several stations of the cross, and so on. I can't help but feel something when I know if if I'm not even walking that route, but if I'm near one of those places, I can feel something, you know, and what I'm feeling is triggered by this sense that there's something that there's an element of sanctity in the place where I am. So we assign greater value to certain symbols and places and things based upon the sanctity moral foundation. The, the sixth one is loyalty, and it's probably the easiest to understand. We don't like people who betray the group. We don't like someone who betrays our country, or someone who um, is perceived as part of the group, leaves the group, and is seen as betraying that group. Why? Why did we develop that sensitivity? Because he got a lot less of it. If someone betrays the group, we know that we're going to be very unhappy with that person. Uh, and this helps form broad-based coalitions and organizations. So things become emotional and powerful when one or more of these six moral foundations is triggered. So what makes a good movie? Well, every Hollywood director understands what I just showed you. Every Hollywood director, I know you want to take a picture of that Thank with you. your pretty Thank pink you. camera. You, I hope you never lose that phone because it's pretty bright. Um, signals become powerful when they touch a person's moral foundations. And every Hollywood director knows it because what makes a good movie? Somebody tell me. Good characters. Good characters. We do what? Why does that make it a good movie? 
How does it emotional connection? Emotional so response. what makes a good movie a good movie? You feel it here, you feel it here. I feel it here. Yeah. Not my stomach. Yeah. My yeah. Yeah. Like, where, where the hell is he from? Where the hell is his heart? <laughs> his heart's in his stomach where sometimes it feels like it is. Um, you feel it here. Right? What makes a good movie is you feel it here. Now the movie has to be credible. Right? So if it looks fake, it doesn't make it past here. Right? It stops here. Ah, oh, that looks ridiculous. Right? But if it looks credible, then it passes that test and it makes it down, it makes it down here. Now what means it's credible? School. Now, I never cried in a movie. Other people do. Like, I would never cry. But why do some people cry in a movie? They know it's fake. They know it's not real. You're watching a digital projection of something that was totally made up and that people were paid to make up, and yet you're crying. I'm not crying. Somebody else is crying. <laughs> why is that happening? What's that original message that you said that um, people judge based on what they? Uh, know or believe. So yes. it connects with what they know or and believe. What did I say intuition was? It was pattern recognition. Yeah. Right? It's close enough. The movie is close enough. But if it looks fake and you can see the strings, you know, from the special effects from the 1970s sci-fi movie, then you don't believe it anymore because now it's a spaceship on a string. Right? <laughs> right? That's no longer credible. But if it looks real, your mind doesn't draw the distinction when it triggers the emotional response. So that's why every Hollywood director understands the power of this. So I'm going to give you four examples. Now I wanted to show four full-length movies. But World Congress of Families said we didn't have eight hours. So I'm going to show you four trailers. Okay? So here's the thing. I'm going to show you four trailers. I'm going to ask you for each one. There, and there's no quiz. Okay, so you're going to get the PowerPoint anyway. But I'm going to ask you which of these moral foundations, which moral foundation is at the center of that film? One of them should be pretty clear. It's at the center of the film. This is why my colleague That's comes with. You could ask him. What? <laughs> what? Thank you. That's the last Coke you ever did. <laughs> yeah, it is right here. Um, thank you very much. I knew that. Um, which moral foundation is at the center of the movie? Okay? So I'm going to show you trailer, and for each one, it's different. So, one of them is going to be one, one of them is going to be the other, and two is not going to be at the center. So, let me show you the first one. You can tell me which moral foundation is at the center of that. You're in the Air Force, right? Marines, actually. How long are you here for? Uh, a few weeks. 30 seconds left, just get us in field goal range! The blackout may run along the entire Northwest Corridor. Them, 
this is just some place. For us, this is our home. What's that movie about? Liberty. Liberty. People say liberty. It's about liberty, right? Liberty is triggered when there's a sign of an oppressor. That oppressor usually being from outside of the group. So interestingly, when they first filmed this movie, the oppressor was supposed to be the Chinese, but then the, the, the movie company decided that might be offensive to the Chinese, so they went in with CGI and they changed it to the North Koreans, which to me made it non-credible at that point. <laughs> A country that can't go grow wheat is not going to invade America. But, <laughs> but this movie is about liberty, right? This movie is about expelling an oppressor, right? Let me show you the second one. Very different type of film. Tell me why. What did you see? This movie drips in sanctity. Religious sanctity, symbols. I'm sorry? Religious symbols. Religious symbols, right? So what group of people were the most upset about this movie? Catholics. Catholics who go to church once, you know, when they get married and then never again? Or Catholics who go to church every Sunday? Right, why? But it's fake. And it's, ex and it's, and it's exploits. It's also, the movie's fake. It's also spinning on their beliefs as well and, and giving a new and different perspective. Right. So you have people, and you're right, you're correct. It triggers this moral foundation, especially in Catholics, right? Because the movie is based upon the Catholic Church, the Catholic symbols, and so on and so forth. The movie Angels and Demons, you see the same thing. And the fact that it's fiction doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter, right? Because what we talked about earlier, that it's close enough. It doesn't matter that it's fake. There's a sanctity at the center of it. But we saw some other ones as well, didn't we? Which other ones did we see? In what form? Right, so the, the, the leads in the movie are going against the authorities, uh, some authorities within the Catholic Church. Right, so you see that at play. What about when the old man is being chased down he's ultimately murdered? Um, we see an element of caring there. We see an element of fairness there. It's not fair that the young thug guy is chasing after the old guy and kills him. That's not number one that uh, triggers both of these because that's not fair. It's not seen as a fair fight. So you see multiple aspects of this but sanctity really be at the center of it. Good. Third one, one of my personal favorites, about something different. 
who can save everyone. Max the coaster, 36 years old, violation today at bus stop 34B. What's the matter? Hair products? Mostly. <laughs> trouble in outer space lately, but uh, <laughs> what's that movie about? Fairness. Fairness? Someone who said fairness, tell me why. The story of hats and hats on. This is Robin Hood. Right? This is, so in this movie, uh, Earth is like shot, the planet's like shot, and all the rich people build themselves a space station and get off, and uh, you know, the Bill Gates of the world are living up on the space station. What do we notice about this? What's different about this space station compared to anything you've seen in Star Wars, Star Trek, or any other sci-fi movie? What's different about the space station? What about it? What'd you see? Oh, just it's like beautiful and spacious. There's mansions, Versace, swimming pools. Why don't we ever see that on a space station? Why did the, the writer, this one person, both the writer and director, why did the writer and director put mansions on the space station? I mean, I'm just, I mean, it would give us more of a feeling of what is it drills the message more strongly, which is which is, is in, well, it makes react in a more dimensional way because the differences of the quality become very, very active. become more visible, right? So, on the flip side, when he was given the pills saying in five days' time you were die, you're going to die. Was that a nice, caring doctor who was saying that to Matt Damon? No. It was a robot, right? Very inhuman, right? In five days' time, you're going to die. That's it. Sorry. That is triggering this moral foundation here, lack of caring, right? 
It's also not particularly fair that uh, when in the beginning part of the trailer, when the robot, uh, when the uh, breaks his arm, was that seen as being, what, what did Matt Damon do just before his arm was broken? He told a joke. He was smiling. And he had his arm gets broken. Triggers this. It's not fair. Why does Matt, why was Matt Damon cast in this role? Because he's likable. Yeah. Exactly. Knows him and loves him. I'm sorry? Everyone knows him and loves him. Right? Yep. I mean, he's a huge lib, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't know that in the movie because he's very pro Second Amendment in the movie. Um, <laughs> so we have the hero who's cast as a very likable person who's on the receiving end of all the, you know, the negatives of this. And then we have the Jodie Foster character who's portrayed as what? Right, she's the mean, cold, cold she's kind of the oppressor, yeah, right? Care. Yeah. She's the, uh, in the movie, she's the Secretary of Defense of the space station. Um, and she plots a coup, which, by the way, triggers this. The authority, so you see a blend. So right? I was seeing authority on, his, on Matt Damon's side as well, um, especially that line in the trailer <laughs> that says, um, if we get you in, you'll decode all of their... Um, their system and whatnot, mm -hmm. because that's essentially the whole plan. We're going to bring all these people here, and their world's going to become our world. We're right. going to overthrow them and, and become them and take right. what they have. So you see a blend of this, <laughs> right? That becomes emotional that way. Let me show you the fourth trailer, and uh, this takes about 15 seconds to, uh, to launch. Very, very different type of movies. So we saw Sanctity, we saw uh, Fairness. Right? We saw Liberty, now we're going to see a different type of film. Saw this movie, um, and uh, saw it with uh, 
uh, my girlfriend at the time, and we walked out of the movie theater, and I turned around and I said, that is the worst movie I have ever seen in my life. Why? Because it was like 15 minutes of you know, fun at the beach, followed by 120 minutes of unrelenting <laughs> human graphic suffering. Like, it was the blood and the gashes and the skin's falling off the back of the leg, and the Naomi Watts character turns blue as a marble by the end of the movie. Spoiler alert, she lives. Uh, and uh, it was terrible. It makes me feel awful. Like, I paid 12 bucks to see this movie. They should have paid me 12 bucks to see this movie. <laughs> because it makes me feel awful, right? Why do I feel awful? Because I feel like I'm watching actual human suffering for that, you know, for that period of time. Because this moral foundation is being, uh, is being triggered. And we see some of the other ones as well, right? Uh, but uh, I think you'll find the caring moral foundations at the center. So, this is, this is not a presentation about Hollywood, so why do we bother showing them? It's because we want to apply these principles in the real world. We want to make sure that you have these tools to recognize the role that these moral foundations play in people's decision making. Here's a really interesting thing that we find. That, <clears throat> first, not everyone ranks each of these moral foundations equally. For some people, they're more important than for other people. And this is really vital. This is not, you know, we care 18, you know, 17 and a half percent about each of these things, each of these six things. For some people, much more than others. And there's a correlation that we can find. The way we find out which of these moral foundations is more important to a person is you pose a moral dilemma. What's a moral dilemma? It's a story that pits one moral foundation against another and you ask a person to make a choice. And very often we don't want to do that because it's, it's hard. Right? Which one of them is more important? Is it okay to steal? Of course not. Is it okay to steal clothes from a department store? Of course not. Is it okay to steal food? Of course not. Is it okay to steal food if you have someone starving at home? Uh, is it okay to steal drugs? No. Is it okay to steal medicine? No. Is it okay to steal medicine if someone is ill and they need it in order to survive, eh, right? It becomes difficult. Right? You also ask people to make, um, to share, well, politically, do you find yourself philosophically on the left, right, center? You're very liberal, moderate, conservative. You know, where do you fall? And this is the correlation you get. You find that among people who identify themselves as very liberal, the caring and fairness moral foundations are dominant. The further to the right you go, the more you find a balance. So among typical people like, so I'm a conservative, so I would fall somewhere around here. And I respond on caring and fairness, but I respond to these as well. So the further to the right you are, the more dominant these wind up being. I'll give you an example. If you have a Tea Party rally, an Occupy rally, where are you going to find more American flags? At the Tea Party rally. Why is that? The Tea Party rally is dominated by people here. The flag is a sign of patriotism. Patriotism is rooted in loyalty, and you find more of that here than on the other side. On the other hand, you will find that, bar none, you will find that the arguments that the left shape that makes on uh, issues such as uh, abortion, uh, traditional marriage, drug legalization, they are all rooted in caring and fairness. There's a concerted effort made that they are owning the caring and fairness side of the argument. And so what you find among people in the middle, and by the way, these people in the middle are not necessarily moderate. Very often they're ambivalent. They don't really care. They don't have a very strong opinion on something. Many people here in the quote center they think about politics or issues and public policy the way I care about football. I mean, I don't care about football, and I just admitted that. I, don't, I could care less. Like, was, and I don't care about baseball. There's some like World Series, whatever the hell it is. I, I have no idea. I don't know who the teams. I know nothing about it. Right? I don't know, and I don't care. Football, I know it's an oblong brown ball, and whoever holds it, everyone wants to get it. That's, that's, that's all I know. Right? So if somebody asks me who's going to win the World Series, I'm like, I don't know who's going to win the World Series. I, I don't know. I don't care. No, no, no. It's, it's Whatever, it's coming up. It's right now, you gotta decide. Okay. I'm gonna reach for something. What am I gonna base a decision on? 
what city they're from, the teams are from, what color the uniforms are, you know, I don't know. I'm going to reach for something familiar to me to make that judgment. And very often to the people in the center here, what's familiar to them is this. They're going to reach for this, these elements of caring and fairness and then decide which side is the side of caring and fairness and or fairness, and that's the side that I'm going to be on. So, the further to the right, the greater balance you find. So if you're in San Francisco, I'm not going to make arguments that you should support my position on anything, because God said it, it's the, you know, a, there's a rule of law and country. I'm not going to root the argument in that. If I'm going to advocate on behalf of anything, in San Francisco, I'm going to try to own the caring and fairness side of the argument. For example, on drug legalization, we will find that proponents of drug legalization will claim they care about glaucoma victims because, because uh, marijuana can ease the suffering of people with glaucoma. And if you oppose legalizing marijuana, then you are clearly not caring about these victims of glaucoma. And you are prohibiting them from having medicine which can alleviate their, su alleviate their suffering. That's the type of argument which you will find. You'll find a fairness argument to say, why is it that if someone is caught with crack cocaine, <clears throat> which many African Americans wind up using and getting caught for, that the jail sentences are 10 times greater than powder cocaine, which white people tend that is a fairness argument, right? Now, by the way, the reason why the crack cocaine penalties are so much greater is that people representing inner cities were so concerned about a crack cocaine epidemic in the 80s that they wanted the greater penalties. But that gets kind of lost in the argument. Now, that's where you find, you know, it, with the, the undermining traditional marriage, you find the exact same thing. Why are you against marriage equality? That's not, that's not equal. If two men want to, you know, if I ran against Gavin Newsom, lieutenant, the, former, the current lieutenant governor of California, who, when he was the mayor of San Francisco, issued marriage licenses to homosexual couples until he was ordered to not do so by, by a judge. So this is the guy who, like, epitomizes this. And what he would say is, this is about love. Two people love each other. Why should you get in the way of two people who love each other being able to get married? That's not fair. That's not fair. And by the way, why do you want to deny homosexual couples the ability to adopt a child? There's so many children out there in foster homes who are in need of loving, caring homes. You would stop that. You must not care about these people. These are the arguments that you find. And you know what? You don't win on those fights. You don't win those fights if you resort to this. If your response is, God said so, you're going to lose. Because among these people, where do you find their, their moral foundations are? You have to own the caring and fairness side of the argument. So now, if you're making an argument in Alabama, which I don't know why I have not moved to Alabama. I think about it all the time. Um, you're going to make a different argument. Right? You're going to make a different argument on the same issue. It doesn't mean that you have a different position on the issue. It's that you're going to frame the argument differently based upon the moral foundations of your target audience. Does that make sense? And a leader, an effective leader, can, think, can read this. Right? An effective leader understands their audience and can shape an argument to be persuasive with that target audience. Does that make sense? What I hope that this does is kind of demystifies a little bit of how these arguments are formed. I happen to have very strong opinions against drug legalization. Uh, and I can make those arguments. My arguments are not based on this. My arguments against drug legalization are based on this. I will make a fairness argument to say that we know, for example, that human brain doesn't finish developing until age 25. Every insurance company knows this. Why is it so much more expensive to rent a car when you're under 25 than over 25? Because the human brain doesn't finish developing that. We also know that the pot that's sold today is dramatically stronger than the pot that was created and sold in the 1960s. And that consuming this drug 
has an adverse impact on the development of the brain. We know this. We know that, it's a gate, that these are gateway drugs can lead to a lifetime of addiction. And it's not fair to young people to send a signal that using these drugs is okay. It's unfair to send a signal to them that maybe they should try this. And that would be fine. It's not fair to them. And, it doesn't, and certainly doesn't show you know, any caring for them whatsoever. In other words, regardless of your position on the issue, it's important to own this side of the argument. You're going to root it here, particularly if your audience is here or there. Does that make sense? OK. So I'll give you a practical implication of this. Here's why Mitt Romney is not president of the United States. Why is Mitt Romney not president of the United States? Because first we saw that among those people in the middle, who are very often more ambivalent than they are moderate, caring and fairness are most important. Right? We saw that. So we see things like this. Why do, you, why do we see a picture like that? Look at this guy. That's somebody's neighbor. Right? Probably doesn't have a lot of money. Probably works hard. And yet, Mitt Romney, who we all know is very, very wealthy, and his company is shipping his job to China. That's not fair. What? Do we care about this guy? That's a sympathetic looking figure, right? This guy's probably just a hardworking guy. It's not fair that his job is being shipped off to China. It's particularly not fair that his job is being shipped off to China by this guy at the center of this picture, the most unfortunate Kodak moment ever. <laughs> this is a photograph going back to Bay and Capital days. They were celebrating. You know, they, this was at a corporate event. Uh, they had made a lot of money. They had done some successful deals. And this is the executives of the company with Mitt Romney in the center. Why does this photo get circular? Because you're creating a caricature of Mitt Romney. Right? We saw this. <laughs> Mitt Romney not tying dogs to roofs anymore. Now why would it? Well, so the story here was, the story was told that uh, you know, Mitt and his family were on vacation one year. And uh, they had the family dog. The car was full. They had the family dog with them. And uh, on the way home, Mitt he tied the dog to the roof of the car. Who would do such a thing? It's man's best friend. You know, it was probably winter. The dog probably froze to death. <coughs> Who would do this to their own dog? Now, the truth is, <coughs> the dog was sick. The dog was in a crate. The crate was tied to the roof of the car. The dog lived. Everything was fine. But why does the story get repeated? Why do we still know the story three, four years later? Because you're creating a caricature of someone who doesn't care even about his own dog. If he doesn't care about his own dog, is he going to care about you? Is this guy going to care about your job? He doesn't even care about his own dog. That's what happens. Like this caricature, by the way, no cat would have, would, would have stood for this. <laughs> that would have been like, Forget it. I'm just getting off and I'll, I'll be fine. Get out of here. We'll drive home. And the Romney people, by the way, we respect people who've run, you know, run for office before us. The Romney people should recognize this because in the California governor's race two years earlier, when Meg Whitman, former uh, CEO of eBay, ran for governor and spent $170 plus million dollars of her own money on the race and lost by 12 points, we saw things like this. Do you think this is the bus that Meg Whitman paid for? Or her opponents paid for? Oh, right. Anyone who says Meg Whitman, you know, wrote it, send you back to Poly Sci 101. Um, the opponents bought this bus. They wrapped this bus. Look, Queen Meg. Look at what we see. We see the text and we see the pictures. Right? It doesn't say rich enough to govern, it says rich enough to rule. Right? What are we portraying Meg Whitman to be? An oppressor. Right? Wealthy, you know, we see the crowns, we see the gold, we see, you know, all of that rich enough to rule. We see things like this. <laughs> right? We're creating a caricature of somebody. What's a caricature? It's a flat, two-dimensional oversimplification of reality. Right? We see things like this. This is Meg Whitman and her bodyguards, Goldman and Sachs. <laughs> Right? This is after we had the whole bank bailout thing and so on and so forth. Creating a caricature, a negative caricature that denies which two qualities. 
caring and fairness. They are creating a caricature of Mitt Romney and Meg Whitman that they, they don't have the qualities of care. And then we saw this. This was Meg Whitman's housekeeper. She was an illegal, she was in the country illegally. She was fired. And the day after the debate with Jerry Brown, she shows up, she does a news conference, and says, Meg Whitman treated me like a piece of garbage. The language is, choose, is chosen very specifically for the same reason why we saw the Versace on the space station. Why? Because it creates a stronger emotional response. And so it is important for you to not be portrayed in this way. That just because you have a pro-family position on life or marriage or whatever it is, that you are not seen as lacking these qualities of caring parents. So we have a strategic connection made <clears throat> when some aspect of a communicator, your ideas or something about your narrative, triggers one or more of these moral foundations. This looks complicated, it's really not. How do we do that? How do we connect something about your story or something about your ideas and make them relevant to the person you're communicating with, to the audience? We do it this way. We want our message to what we call ladder up. Down here, we have you. Up here, we have the audience. And we want to make sure that we make a rational argument for whatever we're talking about. So maybe, it's, maybe it's that I have the experience to do this job, or maybe it's I have this particular plan which I'm, which I'm, which I'm advocating for. And the way we do that is by, we talk about what that is. We talk about the benefits. By the way, this is very often something that people, that people arguing the conservative side of marriage and life don't mention this or are not explicit enough. What are the benefits of your ideas? What are the costs of the other team's ideas? What are the emotional or social consequences of those ideas? And then connect them up to their correct moral foundation. Here's an example of how that works. How many, we all heard that ISIS destroys many of these uh, ancient archaeological treasures in Syria, right? They go into Syria, they go to some you know, ancient building that wasn't bothering anybody, and they go in there and they blow it up, right? Drives me crazy. Why does it drive me crazy? Because of this. Here's what they did. They blew something up. Those sites are lost forever. They cannot be replaced. Special accomplishments of ancient people are, are diminished, they're eradicated. Future generations can never see them again because they've been destroyed. And it triggers the sanctity moral foundation there. Give another example. I'm running for office and I want to spend more money on roads, which sounds very boring. Right? All right. I need to listen to somebody talk about roads. Please get me the, the heck out of here. How do I make that argument relevant? I want to spend more money on roads instead of on trains that nobody uses, for example. I want to spend more money on roads. That's not the end of my argument because I haven't talked about the benefits. What's the benefit if I spend more money on roads? Well, conceivably, they get wider, they get safer, they're more efficient. Oh, so if Ron's elected, he's going to spend more money on roads, which is boring. But the road's going to get wider and safer, more efficient. What does that mean? means traffic moves faster. It means your commute time is shorter. It takes you less time to get home from school or from work. People get home sooner, and maybe that means you're able to make it home in time to, see, to tuck your, your child in to bed at night. Or you can make it to their soccer, soccer game. Or you can make it to their after school play. Or to their after school concert. Or you can play ball with your kid before it gets dark outside. So what have I done? I've taken a very boring issue and I made it relevant to my audience by connecting it to a moral foundation. So let me show you an example of how we do this in advertising. This is a, an ad for one of the people who was in the debate last night. It's an old ad. The future of New York belongs to our children. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a chemist. I want to be a surgeon. That's why we've invested more in our schools than ever before. I want to be an artist. A doctor. A protector. Engineer. Thousands of new teachers. More computers. 
and after school programs. I want to be. I want to. I want to. In New York, you can be anything. I want to be governor. Me too. Proverbs, Jungle, Ben. That's an old ad that's from 2002. And why do I love that ad? Because it takes a relatively boring topic of I'm going to spend more money on schools, big deal. And it makes it into a caring issue. I'm spending more money on schools, more teachers, better classrooms, more computers, after school programs. The inference is, the psychosocial consequences, children are better prepared for the future, and that triggers a caring moral foundation. That's why that ad works. I can also make a second argument that's not in the ad. I can make it into a fairness argument as well. Well, children in tough neighborhoods with better schools might actually have a shot at succeeding in society, which they wouldn't otherwise have. And that triggers a fairness moral foundation. So now I've taken relatively boring topics and I make them relevant to people. So what makes a communicator strong? What makes a communicator, what makes you more persuasive when you communicate with people? And I would point to three things. Three things that you should have when you're in a when you're up here communicating with any size or group of audience, in a leadership position or otherwise, that there are three things which together are going to make you a strong presenter. And you should polish these three areas because it will make you more effective for whatever it is you're doing. And this will help you whether it's in the workplace or in the public policy arena or arguing for something at church or whatever you're engaged in. If you focus on these three areas, you will be more persuasive. One of them is your plans or your ideas. Those should be robust, those should be well developed, etc. And a political camp, last night, if I had to hear one more time about somebody's plan, you know, for something, you know, <laughs> like we have plans coming out of our ears. But the plans don't make the difference. It's one element of it, but it's not enough. The second part, and the more powerful part is your narrative or your story. Your narrative. Your, not your church's narrative or the school's narrative or whatever you're arguing on behalf of, but your narrative, your story. How did you get here? So I just spent four days last week at a big major donor conference uh, centered on Israel. And everybody in the room donates at least a good good amount of money to do this cause. And some don't need a great deal of money for that cause. And the point that I made to them is, don't tell us about your organization's history. That's great. You can tell us about it. But what I really want to know is, why are you raising money on behalf of this group? What brought you to this position? Why are you doing this instead of running your business or helping your family or you know whatever, you know, playing softball? Why are you doing this? instead of something else. What's your personal story? What's your journey that you came through to do that? And you know what that's going to do? That's going to dramatically improve your ability to relate to your audience. Yes? I have a question. Uh, for example, we have the election going on, like I said. But for example, we had Perry and Walker drop out of the race. And both of them were relatively good governors in their state. But for example, they had good success rates, they had decent plans, yet they failed. But then you have somebody like Huckabee, who might not have been as successful as a governor as, they, as the two of them, mm -hmm. is as conservative as they are, mm -hmm. yet he's doing better. So what do you think that is? And what did Walker and Perry do wrong that Huckabee might not have? <laughs> I see the big smile on Robert's face here. Um, what's the third parameter up there? Your skill. So you can have great plans, great ideas, which both men have. You could have a great narrative, which both men had. But if you hire 90 people on your campaign staff, and you don't have the money to pay them, guess what's going to happen? You're not on that stage last night. This does not mean these are not men with great ideas and with a great narrative and are good and honorable men. But at the end of the day, who's ultimately responsible for for your campaign, the leader is, the candidate is. And you can delegate that to the campaign manager, consultants, and so on, but the person ultimately responsible, the head of the org chart, 
is the candidate. And so you have touched upon, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but the third area is your skill. What are your plans? What's your narrative? And how good are your skills? And I can tell you, you know what the first step is on the road to wisdom? Not hiring Rick Lighty. <laughs> Not hiring someone who, pay, who hires 90 people. Uh, <laughs> no. The first step on the road to wisdom is humility. I've advised and worked with people in public policy for 25 years since I had a full head of hair and a mustache. Um, and the first step on the road to wisdom is humility. Because if you lack humility, you cannot learn. The first step in being able to improve your skill is to be able to say to yourself, there are things I don't yet know. That requires a degree of humility, which some people do not have. And I can't tell you, how, and Robert knows this quite well because we do training around the world together. How many times have we run into somebody, no, 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 I don't need any political training. I've already been elected dog catcher. I know everything there is to know about politics. It's the truth. Oh, I won the dog catcher race. Okay, well clearly you're like the Albert Einstein of politics. <laughs> Very often they lack humility. And this stops them from being able to learn more. So always keep this in mind. There's always more. I'm 45 years old. I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm always reading. I'm always looking for more. I'm always watching. You know, I'm always learning. Uh, and that's how you get better. First by admitting, no matter how good you are, there is more that you don't know than you do know. Which is very humbling. Right? The amount of human knowledge is doubling about every 20 years. Right? More rapidly now. So, that third area is your skill. So I would argue, very respectfully, that Rick Perry, the people under him, were not making decisions that were ideal. Otherwise, he'd still be running. By the way, no candidate drops out of the presidential race because of polls. That is a fancy. Um, people don't drop out because of the polls. They drop out because they run out of money. Now, when I ran for lieutenant governor, uh, we didn't run into that mistake. We, didn't, we had no debt. The entire campaign, we had no debt. Now, we didn't win, but at least we didn't have any debt. So what you have to do is you have to you run for an office, and you have to make sure that the business side of the business is running. This is like a church. What happens when a church is run by someone who's very good in terms of the ministry, but cannot balance a checkbook? You don't have a church anymore. Right? And how many churches close or get into financial difficulty or whatever because somebody thought my job is just to do the Lord's work. Well, the Lord wants to make sure you can run the business of the church as well. Otherwise, the, even the Lord's not going to keep the lights on. <laughs> There's an element of skill involved as well. So this alone doesn't do it, but it's, it's the combination of these three things. So when you go out, when you leave this room and you leave this conference, there will be occasions when you have to tell parts of your story. But you have a long story. So which parts of your story shall we tell? That's the key to developing your narrative. And I want to show you an example of how one leader in one group and one organization tells their narrative and tells their story. experience started off here. I grew up picking crops with my family. My parents were immigrants from Mexico with nothing but a fourth grade education. We were so poor. My siblings and I would often miss school to work in the fields. Our home was the size of a tool shed. It had no running water. And what we would do is warm buckets of water on the stove so that when my parents returned from work in the fields, uh, they would bathe uh, with small cups. My father never took welfare because he didn't want to depend on anyone to reduce his dignity. He is a proud and noble man. He could make it with just three things. He got good credit and freedom, liberty to work. And that's what the United States is. You know, I didn't know it at the time, but my father began saving money and buying and selling small properties. He 
and buy a motel with the profit he made. My family and I spent long hours fixing up that motel while still working the fields. My father continued to buy himself property, and one day he and my mother retired with enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. If I don't come to the United States, I don't think I have the life that we got right now, living so good, you know. My parents' American dream had become a reality. My family and I have succeeded by following the path to freedom. But that path is on the verge of vanishing. What we're starting to see here in America now is a growth in the size and the scope of government that is now starting to look like the governments that we left behind. I'm just torn apart when I see folks who are caught in this um, dependency that government offers. And not only that, they condemn their children to a life of mediocrity and subsistence. And this is not the American dream. This is an American nightmare. The Libre Initiative is reaching the Hispanic community before they are lost forever. We know advancing economic freedom is the best way to improve human well-being, especially those at the bottom. And that's our message to the world. You know, one day I was speaking before a group of 150 evangelical Hispanic ministers in South Texas, and a man stood up. He had tears in his eyes and said, you know, I've never heard these things before. Why has nobody told us? Most Hispanics have never even heard about economic freedom, but they know it. Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, Hispanics leave countries that have been ruined by tyranny to come to America, the land of the free. They don't just believe in the cause, they lived it. <coughs> it is a privilege to live in the United States because this is a nation where you dictate your destiny. No other nation has fulfilled more dreams and more aspirations than this country. And to have been born here, uh, I'm just grateful to God for that. Learn how you can get involved at joinneedler.org. What do you think of that? Pretty powerful, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is about a group called Libre Initiative. Two minutes about whatever group. Did, this, did you see offices in Washington, D.C. and bureaucrats and cubicles and stuff like that? No. But I'm sure if you go to the Libre Initiative office, there are cubicles and there are people in cubicles and they're, you know, they're, they're doing PowerPoints. Not that there's anything wrong with PowerPoints, uh, and, et cetera. But that's not a compelling narrative. So we, held a we heard the narrative from one man, Daniel Garza, telling his story of his organization through his own personal narrative, through his own story. And he did it powerfully with, with visuals. So it wasn't just words, it was with visuals. So your narrative is not just what you said. It's not just what you said. A picture does uh, speak a thousand words. And so I hope that you will make sure that as you go through life that you will tell your own story and that you will save the pictures and the, the video and the clips and the examples that punctuate your life and your experiences because that will be part of your narrative that will help you into the, into the future. Because that narrative will give you credibility for whatever it is that you're choosing to do uh, going forward. So I'm going to close with, uh, with uh, two more things. And by the way, has this been helpful today? Yes, yeah. Helpful? Okay, feel a little bit better prepared going forward. Lots of stuff to think about. Um, we saw earlier how the, the audience judgment making model. Right. When you are ever you are going to go give a talk, I want you to think of four questions and answer these four questions before you give your talk. And you can do it while you're in the car driving to the talk with me. These are four by the way, I have a four-year degree in political science. Worthless. <laughs> Worthless. Just something to bear in mind. Uh, with apologies to all the political science you know, graduates here uh, in the world, because I didn't learn this stuff in my political science class. Because political science classes don't teach you how to win at anything. It's all <laughs> academic, right? Here's how the world is. But you can change the world. But when you, when you give a presentation, I want you to frame it. We call it four framing questions, and here's what they are. Number one, who am I talking to? Am I talking to a group of Catholics, Christians, working single mothers, you know, Prius owners from San Francisco, farmers, who entrepreneurs? Who am I talking to? Students, who am I talking to? Good students, bad students, and mixed. Who am I talking to? Number one. Number two, 
what do I want them to do? I'm amazed how many time, times I hear her talk. I'm like, okay, that was really interesting. What do you want me to do? What is the call to action? We are here at World Congress of Families because we want to change things for the better. So when you give your talk, what do you want people to do? And don't think that that's automatic. People don't automatically know what you want them to do. Make sure that that's clear. Three, what's the underlying context? What's going on? You know, I've been to Israel 10 times, been to the Holy Land 10 times. The first time I went to Israel was as a trainer for the State Department, the State Department funded program. And my job was to go to the West Bank and train Palestinian women running against Hamas in the upcoming election. Okay. Now, if there was ever a time when you have to know what the underlying context is, it's in something like that. Because you can say all these great things, but if you don't understand the underlying context of what's really going on, you're not going to be as effective. I remember we had just crossed into the West Bank from Jordan. We had a Palestinian driver, State Department person in the back. And I'm, I'm in the front seat of the car. And I made a blah, 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 making some reference to the uh, Israeli occupied territories, is the word that I used. And all of a sudden, she reaches from the back seat to the front and starts poking me. What, what, what are you poking me about? Right? Like, what, what I realized later is, Israeli occupied territory is not the right thing to say with the Palestinian driver in the car. Right? It's just not a useful thing to say. So I had just gotten there. You know, I didn't know what the underlying context was. Now I can you know, get a, you know, do a dissertation on that. But I, I had to bone up on what the underlying context was. So I spent the next several days reading and reading and reading and reading to understand what was going on so that when I did the training, I could be more effective. And number four, what are the alternatives? If people don't do your thing, what could they do? What does someone else ask them to do? Maybe you're lobbying on behalf of the bill related to, you know, whatever the issue is, Planned Parenthood, or, or you know, your church's ability to put uh, an extension on the back, or, or whatever it is. What are the competitive alternatives to what it is that you are looking for? Now, here's the trick. This is not what you're going to say in your talk. This is what you're going to keep in mind as you prepare what you're going to it's not, okay, I'm talking to you, and here's what I want you to do, and here's what's going on, and here's what you do instead of what, like, you wouldn't do that. It's, these are the things to bear in mind uh, when you do that, as you're developing what your talk is. Uh, there is one final video. I'm going to close with this, so we close with fun stuff. I think you'll find this interesting. You may want to take this down. It, it, this is called The Science of Persuasion. I think it's really interesting. I think we'll give you a little bit of insight as to how people behave. It might actually give you a couple of tools to use uh, before the conference wraps up. So here we go. Researchers have been studying the factors that influence us to say yes to the requests of others for over 60 years. And there can be no doubt that there's a science to how we are persuaded. And a lot of this science is surprising. When making a decision, it would be nice to think that people consider all the available information in order to guide their thinking. But the reality is very often different. In the increasingly overloaded lives we lead, more than ever, we need shortcuts or rules of thumb to guide our decision making. My own research has identified just six of these shortcuts as universals that guide human behavior. They are reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking, and consensus. Understanding these shortcuts and employing them in an ethical manner can significantly increase the chances that someone will be persuaded by your request. Let's take a closer look at each in turn. So the first universal principle of influence is reciprocity. Simply put, people are obliged to give back to others the form of behavior, gift, or service that they have received first. If a friend invites you to their party, there's an obligation for you to invite them to a future party you are hosting. If a colleague 
does you a favor, then you owe that colleague a favor. And in the context of a social obligation, people are more likely to say yes to those that they owe. One of the best demonstrations of the principle of reciprocation comes from a series of studies conducted in restaurants. So the last time you visit a restaurant, there's a good chance that the waiter or waitress will have given you a gift, probably at about the same time that they bring your bill. A liqueur, perhaps, or a fortune cookie, or perhaps a simple mint. So here's the question. Does the giving of a mint have any influence over how much tip you're going to leave them? Most people will say no, but that mint can make a surprising difference. In the study, giving diners a single mint at the end of their meal typically increased tips by around 3%. Interestingly, if the gift is doubled and two mints are provided, tips don't double. They quadruple, a 14% increase in tips. But perhaps most interestingly of all is the fact that if the waiter provides one mint, starts to walk away from the table, but pauses, turns back, and says, for you nice people, is an extra mint, tips go through the roof. A 23% increase, influenced not by what was given, but how it was given. So the key to using the principle of reciprocation is to be the first to give, and to ensure that what you give is personalized and unexpected. The second universal principle of persuasion is scarcity. Simply put, people want more of those things they can have less of. When British Airways announced in 2003 that they would no longer be operating the twice-daily London-New York Concord flight because it had become uneconomical to run, sales the very next day took off. Notice that nothing had changed about the Concorde itself. It certainly didn't fly any faster, the service didn't suddenly get better, and the airfare didn't drop. It had simply become a scarce resource, and as a result, people wanted it more. So when it comes to effectively persuading others using the scarcity principle, the science is clear. It's not enough simply to tell people about the benefits they'll gain if they choose your products and services. You'll also need to point out what is unique about your proposition and what they stand to lose if they fail to consider your proposal. Our third principle of influence is the principle of authority. The idea that people follow the lead of credible knowledge or more experts. Physiotherapists, for example, are able to persuade more of their patients to comply with recommended exercise programs if they display their medical diplomas on the walls of their consulting rooms. People are more likely to give change for a parking meter to a complete stranger if that requester wears a uniform rather than casual clothes. What the science is telling us is that it's important to signal to others what makes you a credible, knowledgeable authority before you make your influence attempt. Of course, this can present problems. You can hardly go around telling potential customers how brilliant you are, but you can certainly arrange for someone to do it for you. And surprisingly, the science tells us that it doesn't seem to matter if the person who introduces you is not only connected to you, but also likely to prosper from the introduction themselves. One group of real estate agents were able to increase both the number of property appraisals and the number of subsequent contracts that they wrote by arranging for reception staff who answered customer inquiries to first mention their colleagues' credentials and expertise. So, customers interested in letting a property were told, lettings? Let me connect you with Sandra, who has over 15 years experience letting properties in this area. Customers who wanted more information about selling properties were told, speak to Peter, our head of sales. He has over 20 years experience selling properties. I'll put you through now. The impact of this expert introduction led to a 20% rise in the number of appointments and a 15% increase in the number of signed contracts. Not bad for a small change informed from persuasion science that was both ethical and costless to implement. The next principle is consistency. People like to be consistent with the things they have previously said or done. Consistency is activated by looking for and asking for small initial commitments that can be made. In one famous set of studies, researchers found rather unsurprisingly that very few people would be willing to erect an unsightly wooden board on their front lawn to support a drive safely campaign in their neighborhood. However, in a similar neighborhood, close by, 
four times as many homeowners indicated that they would be willing to erect this unsightly billboard. Why? Because 10 days previously, they had agreed to place a small postcard in the front window of their home that signaled their support for a Drive Safely campaign. That small card was the initial commitment that led to a 400% increase in a much bigger but still consistent change. So, when seeking to influence using the consistency principle, the detective of influence looks for voluntary, active, and public commitments, and ideally gets those commitments in writing. For example, one recent study reduced missed appointments at health centers by 18% simply by asking the patients rather than the staff to write down appointment details on the future appointment card. The fifth principle is the principle of liking. People prefer to say yes to those that they like. But what causes one person to like another? Persuasion science tells us that there are three important factors. We like people who are similar to us, we like people who pay us compliments, and we like people who cooperate with us towards mutual goals. As more and more of the interactions that we are having take place online, it might be worth asking whether these factors can be employed effectively in, let's say, online negotiations. In a series of negotiation studies carried out between MBA students of two well-known business schools, some groups were told, time is money, get straight down to business. In this group, around 55% were able to come to an agreement. A second group, however, were told, before you begin negotiating, exchange some personal information with each other, identify a similarity you share in common, then begin negotiating. In this group, 90% of them were able to come to successful and agreeable outcomes that were typically worth 18% more to both parties. So to harness this powerful principle of liking, be sure to look for areas of similarity that you share with others and genuine compliments you can give before you get down to business. The final principle is consensus. Especially when they are uncertain, people will look to the actions and behaviors of others to determine their own. You may have noticed that hotels often place a small card at bathrooms that attempt to persuade guests to reuse their towels and linen. Most do this by drawing a guest's attention to the benefits that reuse can have on environmental protection. It turns out that this is a pretty effective strategy, leading to around 35% compliance. But could there be an even more effective way? Well, it turns out that about 75% of people who check into a hotel for four nights or longer will reuse their towels at some point during their stay. So what would happen if we took a lesson from the principle of consensus and simply included that information on the cards and said that 75% of our guests reuse their towels at some time during their stay? So please do so as well. It turns out that when we do this, towel reuse rises by 26%. Now imagine the next time you stay in a hotel, you saw one of these signs. You picked it up and you read the following message. 75% of people who have stayed in this room have reused their towel. What would you think? Well, here's what you might think. I hope they're not the same towels. <laughs> And like most people, you probably think that this sign will have no influence on your behavior whatsoever. But it turns out that changing just a few words on a sign to honestly point out what comparable previous guests have done was the single most effective message, leading to a 33% increase in reuse. So, the science is telling us that rather than relying on our own ability to persuade others, we can point to what many others are already doing, especially many similar others. So there we have it. Six scientifically validated principles of persuasion that provide for small, practical, often costless changes that can lead to big differences in your ability to influence and persuade others in an entirely ethical way. They are the secrets from the science of persuasion. What do you think of that? Pretty cool, right? Yeah.
And what does this have to do with leadership? Leaders, leaders are able to persuade others. We're about to have a you know, nomination contest on the Democratic side, Republican side. You know what we call people who can't persuade others? Losers. <laughs> right? That might be leaders, but who's the top leader? The one who persuades most people. You know, for some people, there's a disconnect between being able to persuade and being a leader. These are one and the same. These are closely tied together. So, was this helpful today? Was this yes. helpful? Gave us some new tools? Great. Thank you.